Good afternoon, all. My name is Megan O'Reilly, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on measuring the health benefits of energy efficiency and renewables. I will be your moderator today, and I'm looking forward to the presentations by some of my regulatory assistance project colleagues, as well as by one of the experts involved in the development of a new environmental protection agency tool that allows us to take a closer look at the health benefits of energy efficiency and renewable energy choices. Before we get started, I'd like to go over the format for today's webinar and a few housekeeping matters. First, as usual, we are going to keep the presentations limited so that we have a good amount of time for questions and answers during the remainder of the scheduled hour. Also, after this scheduled hour-long webinar, we will stay on for an additional 30 minutes for any further questions. Because we have so many participants today, we will keep all participants muted, so please submit your questions into the questions pane in GoToWebinar. And we are also recording the session, and we will be sending links to the recording and the slides to everyone within a few days. So with those logistics behind us, let's get into today's topic. As our presenters will discuss in more detail, the impacts of air pollution on health are startling, and recent research and reporting on those impacts reveals just how severe the consequences of poor air quality can be on health and mortality. Despite recognizing these impacts generally, it has been difficult to include them in analyses about different energy choices in a precise way. EPA has developed a new tool that allows state and local governments, policymaker, policymakers, and stakeholders to estimate the monetized public health benefits of investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy. EPA's new tool looks at the benefits of these choices as benefits per kilowatt hour, and presents them in a way that they can be included in comparisons of different energy scenarios. So with that, let me turn to our presenters. First, we are very happy to have Emma Zinsmeister. Emma is a Senior Community Program Specialist with US EPA's State and Local Energy and Environment Program. Emma specializes in climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies for communities across the United States. And importantly, she was one of the experts who developed the report that inspired today's presentation. Next, we have Nancy Seidman. Nancy is a senior advisor with RAP. She has over 30 years working on environmental and energy issues at the state, regional, and federal level. At RAP, she focuses on the intersection of energy and environmental policies, assisting policymakers on the energy transition, climate change, air quality, and the benefits of energy efficiency. And finally, our last presentation will be from Jim Lazar, who is also a senior advisor with RAP and an expert in rate design and resource planning. And with that, I'll turn it to Emma to get us started. Welcome, Emma, and thank you for being here with us today. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Megan, for that generous introduction. And thank you to everyone from RAP from, for having me here today. I am incredibly excited to be on this webinar and talking with you about a new report that EPA released uh, this summer to help simplify the process of assessing the health benefits of efficiency and renewable energy. This report was released over the summer by my program at EPA, which is the State and Local Energy and Environment Program. We provide a wide range of analytical tools and informational resources to help state and local governments reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other air pollution to meet their environmental, energy, and economic goals. In the report we released this summer, um, we provide for the first time estimates of the health benefits of efficiency and renewables on a cents per kilowatt hour basis. We developed this report and the associated values uh, for 10 regions of the United States and four different types of technology, including wind and solar energy and uniform and peak energy efficiency. We designed this resource to be free, easy to use, and based on a robust peer-reviewed methodology. We specifically look at the health benefits that can be achieved by using efficiency and renewable energy to reduce fine particulate matter from fossil fuel-based generation. So this report does not look at uh, health impacts that would be derived from ozone or carbon dioxide pollution. Details on the full methodology that we use to develop these values and the appropriate uses for these values are included in our technical report, which is available on EPA's website. And I highly encourage everyone on this webinar today to take a look at that report and download the values. We developed this new resource because we knew that 
energy efficiency and renewable energy are cost-effective and important strategies for reducing generation from fossil fuel-based power plants, and that these plants are critical sources of fine particulate matter pollution, known as PM2.5. And we also had been hearing from state and local governments and other stakeholders that there was a need for a value, like a cents per kilowatt hour value, to help with assessing air quality benefits, um, dry air quality health related benefits um, derived from efficiency renewables in order to fully account, more fully account for the value of efficiency and renewable, and because this type of resource didn't exist. Many analysts either did not know how to credibly assess the health related benefits or didn't have the technical capacity in-house to do some of the modeling that can be um, quite complex. So as I mentioned, uh, the values that we have developed look at the health-related uh, benefits of avoiding fine particulate pollution from fossil fuel-based power plants. In the U.S., air pollution is the eighth leading risk factor for mortality, accounting for more deaths than alcohol use or drug use. And we specifically decided to look at PM2.5 because it makes up the bulk of these health impacts. And the small size of these particles is what really leads to their harmful effect. They're able to travel deep into the airways, cross into the bloodstream, and result in many detrimental health impacts, including mortality, cardiovascular and respiratory impacts, as well as restrictions on activity and productivity. So we knew going into this analysis that the health benefits from efficiency and renewables are important, and that analysts are looking for simplified means in order to quantify them. At EPA, we had a set of existing tools that could be used to analyze and develop cents per kilowatt hour values through a multi-stage analysis. And by doing this, EPA could provide a set of regionally, uh, a reg set of values uh, for different regions across U the U.S. Uh, using a consistent methodology to fill a critical uh, analytical gap and simplify the process for the end user. So in our report, we detail the methodology um, that we used. To start, we worked with and consulted with experts in the field to develop different scenarios of wind, solar, and energy efficiency that we wanted to assess. We then used one of our tools known as the Avoided Emissions and Generation Tool. This tool breaks the electricity grid into 10 regions for the United States, and by putting in the scenarios that we developed, we were able to estimate the changes in electricity generation from fossil fuel-based sources and the associate changes in emissions of PM2.5 directly from those sources, as well as nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide, which react in the atmosphere to form additional PM2.5. From there, we were able to put the results into our co-benefits risk assessment health impacts screening and mapping tool, which is known as COBRA. This tool can take changes in emissions, convert them into changes in air quality, and then use a set of functions to determine the health impacts and assess those health impacts at dollar value. So in the end, we were able to take for each of the 10 regions and four technology types, the health benefits that were achieved, their monetary value, and divide them by the kilowatt hours either that were saved through efficiency or generated through, regional, uh, through renewable energy. The COBRA model provides different um, options for choosing discount rates and um, sensitivity levels related to the health impacts. So we have multiple sets of benefits per kilowatt hour values. This slide here shows the set of final values using a 3% discount rate and a, a low estimate of sensitivity and health outcomes. You can see that these values range from just under half a cent per kilowatt hour, hour to over three and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Um, with assumptions for greater sensitivity of health, the um, upward end of this range actually increases to over 8 cents per kilowatt hour. The important trend to note here is that the values vary more by region than they do by technology type. And this is largely related to the fact that um, having population centers closer to sources of emissions that provide more pollution, like say, High populations and having high pop regions with high population centers closer to uh, generation, say, coming from coal, they're more reducing those emissions has a greater health impact as opposed to, say, population centers closer to cleaner generation or generation sources that aren't near population centers. So, with this new resource, our objective really was to. Uh, convert, move from the uh, multi-stage analysis that EPA produced to basically simplifying the process of analysis to one equation for multiplication. 
So analysts were interested in looking at and estimating the health-related benefits that come from investments in efficiency and renewables simply need to select the appropriate BPK value for their analysis. So for their region, the technology type of interest, and um, their choice between the sensitivity levels and discount rates, they select that value and then simply multiply it either by the kilowatt hours of, of energy saved from efficiency or generated by renewable energy. We developed these values to help regional, state, and local governments assess the impacts of their investments in efficiency and renewables and be able to have values that they can include into their decision-making processes. And you'll hear more about potential uses for these values from the in the presentations from Nancy and Jim. So in closing, EPA's new values are a free and credible resource to simplify the process of accounting for the important and significant values uh, that health values, benefits that efficiency and renewables can provide by reducing fine particulate matter. Um, we hope that you will uh, go to our website and check out these values, the report and um, set of values are available on our website, as well as the Avert and Cobra tools. We also have newsletters that you can sign up for to learn more about our resources. You're also welcome to contact me if you have any questions about how to use these tools. And with that, I will say thank you and pass it over to the next speaker. Uh, good That's afternoon, amazing, everyone. Doesn't... Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Seidman. Thank you very much, Emma, for that great presentation. So RAP published a paper in 2013 that talks about a layer cake of benefits for energy efficiency. It's entitled Recognizing the Full Value of Energy Efficiency, and it's available for free to download on our website. Many layers are shown here, divided between utility system benefits, participant benefits, and societal benefits. We included benefits in two areas. First, participant health benefits, for example, reduced air infiltration and mold, but that's not what the EPA tool addresses. We also included health impacts in the societal benefit part, which is shown here circled in red, and that is the segment that EPA's benefit per kilowatt hour tool addresses. Our report addressed energy efficiency, but we quickly realized after we published it that many of the same benefits accrue when renewable energy resources are used. The EPA tool puts some substance and quantification into the societal benefits layer of this cake, as much as eight cents per kilowatt hour. And that's just one sliver of the total benefits of energy efficiency shown in the layer cake. The benefits accrue from reduced health impacts of criteria pollutants, primarily uh, reductions in fine particles, from polluting power plants when those power plants are displaced by wind, solar, or energy efficiency. In areas relatively near a power plant that has its emissions reduced, we see improved health benefits as Emma has described. So there are a number of air quality regulators and those working in health participating in today's webinars. I want to encourage you to get involved in your area's energy efficiency programs. We believe it can help you accomplish your goals with the help of the new data on health benefits from reducing fossil energy use through energy efficiency or renewable energy. So first, our overall goal is improve public health, something we all care about. Energy efficiency reduces all pollutants at once. A kilowatt hour avoided is energy use avoided and fossil fuel use avoided, avoided means health benefits. Second, for those in the energy world, air quality regulators have federal requirements for improving visibility in national parks and other scenic areas. And I have an example coming up relevant to this. Third, EPA requires specific plans with specific documentation for demonstrating progress in areas not meeting public health standards, which is called non-attainment areas and air quality speak and for regional haze. So documenting energy efficiency and its health benefits can add credibility to the use of energy efficiency in air quality planning. And lastly, I wanna mention that energy efficiency can meet all of EPA's requirements for being part of an enforceable plan for ozone or regional haze. Those are listed here being permanent, quantifiable, 
surplus and enforceable reductions. I'm happy to explain those terms if folks would like. So to demonstrate an example, this slide is from a project we've been working with Arkansas on to document how energy efficiency benefits regional haze. Begun before the benefit per kilowatt hour tool was released, we are now able to extend our analysis. Regional haze is a program from the 1990 Clean Air Act that requires states to develop plans to improve visibility in areas like national parks. States update their plans every 10 years, and Arkansas has proposed using efficiency in the plan they are working on now. The, Arizona, the Arkansas, excuse me, Arkansas Public Service Commission evaluates energy savings targets every three years. Their utilities have historically met or exceeded 100% of those targets. And based on this, the Public Service Commission has raised the targets five times since 2007. The savings targets for the next planning cycle, 20 to 22, is also being increased to 1.2% of retail sales for over each of those three years. So note how Arkansas has increased their savings between 2010 and 2017. So to develop the health benefits estimates for Arkansas, we used EPA's values for two overt regions, since Arkansas is split, the 3% discount rate and the high and low values. For the last year in the previous slide, 2017, the Public Service Commission noted the program cost about $73.5 million. And the benefit per kilowatt hour benefits for that year are estimated at $5.6 to $12.7 million. So those are substantial benefits offsetting some of the costs of the program in a year. And if you consider that most energy efficiency measures have about a 10-year lifespan, then the calculated benefits are really around 10 times higher, covering well over the program's costs. So these are benefits that Arkansas has not included when it set its targets for those years. So one way to look at this is that the program costs less than expected for a program that was already cost effective. Or another way would be that the program could afford, in quotes, to do more if the health benefits were included in their calculation of what is cost effective. Using EPA's benefit per kilowatt hour tool, we can see that energy efficiency is a measure that helps pay for itself, and in some areas may even have a negative cost and more than pays for itself. So one question air quality regulators might ask of your energy colleagues would be, what tests do you use to screen our efficiency programs and how do we account for their costs and benefits? For example, do we use the societal cost test for our programs? If so, EPA's tool fits right in with that test, and you can use it to demonstrate health benefits and add to that layer of the cake. The tool can improve your analysis and will likely justify more efficiency that will lead to lower pollution and higher health benefits. Another question of your colleagues might be, what is our average cost of energy saved through energy efficiency? And how does that compare to what this tool says about health and benefits of efficiency in our area? Perhaps without considering other energy, and other energy benefits, energy efficiency may be justified based only on the health benefits. If you don't use the societal cost test, find out which one you use and how the EPA tool might fit in. Or help your energy colleagues look at the benefits to health that result from your existing programs. For ozone planning, you might think about what are your options for reducing nitrogen oxides? Is efficiency less expensive than those? Or can your attainment modeling include energy efficiency? And for regional haze, as I mentioned the Arkansas example, the regional haze program doesn't usually talk about health benefits explicitly, but the benefit per kilowatt hour tool allows you to add that into your analysis as extra benefits. Or you could consider them negative calories in the layer cake analysis. So here's an example with renewable energy. We did some calculations based on 100 megawatts of wind and solar, including estimating their capital costs at around 20.2 million for wind and 12.2 for solar. And we compared those costs to the health benefits from using renewable energy down at the lower part of the chart for the upper Midwest. And you can see there are substantial benefits compared to the capital costs for these renewable energies. 
The step uh, we used to get the values for the upper Midwest included assuming how many kilowatt hours could be generated by 100 megawatts of each resource, including transmission losses, and keeping track of all the zeros between megawatts and kilowatts and kilowatt hours and dollars and cents. EPA's benefit per kilowatt values take into account the generation on the grid that is backed down if renewable energy is used. Then based on the impact of reduced fossil fuel use, primarily the benefits of reduced particulate matter, EPA's factors estimate the values of benefits for kilowatt hours of fossil generation avoided in dollars. In other words, EPA's benefit per kilowatt hour tool takes the impact of avoided fossil generation turns it into reduced pollution, and then provides the value in dollars of health benefits achieved from that reduced pollution. Nancy, this is Jim. I have to interrupt for just a second on that slide. The dollar amounts that are shown are the annualized capital costs uh, and need to be compared to the annualized values at the bottom of the slide. And I apologize for the confusion I created when I produced the original spreadsheet. Thank you, Jim. So, Thank you very much. So the numbers are comparable. Yes, the numbers are comparable and still uh, more than uh, extremely valuable in terms of the health benefits they provide. So the, our points are still valid. But Thank you, Jim, for that correction. So I wanted to wrap up with a few thoughts on how this tool can promote collaboration between energy and environmental regulators. You can collaborate across agencies on energy planning with your energy planning or integrated resource planning in states where that is applicable, and on energy efficiency, as I talked about with the Arkansas example. You can consider eMERGE, which is a RAP concept for joint energy and air quality planning. For example, using your state's renewable portfolio standard or clean energy goals to include the health benefits of those goals when new renewable energy is being cited and installed. So to sum up, EPA's tool provides a fabulous way for air quality agencies to demonstrate the value of efficiency and renewables for health benefits, to work with your colleagues at other agencies, to look at options for attainment and regional haze planning, and to demonstrate how clean energy resources can help meet air quality and public health goals. Air quality regulators can take actions with your energy colleagues and make it easier and less expensive to achieve your area's health and energy goals. And now I'd like to turn this over to Jim. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Emma and Nancy understand air pollution and the health impacts of air pollution. I'm an economist and I mostly understand financial impacts. I'll talk for the next few minutes about how the information in the EPA report can be used to make better financial decisions in the utility industry. I'll address three specific topics, procurement, uh, rate design, uh, and, uh, and tax policy. The EPA report provides us with ranges for each type of resource, efficiency, solar, and wind. The results are regional. They're calculated at both low and high estimates of impact and computed with different discount rates. Here I show an excerpt from the report. For California, energy efficiency uh, is valued at 0 0.4 to 1.2 cents a kilowatt hour. In the Great Lakes, mid-Atlantic region, where polluting power plants are closer to population centers, it goes as high as 8.3 cents. The point is that the values are different from resource type to resource type, and from region to region. The zero is not the right number, ever. Many states already consider externalities like air pollution in the valuation of energy efficiency. This example from Vermont is a few years old, but it includes a wide range of values to energy efficiency, from utility system values included in the revenue requirement at the bottom, to societal benefits of various kinds that are not in the utility revenue requirement at, at the top. The EPA report provides us some hard data to insert into the externalities portion of this set of values. Adding the health benefits 
to the mix of economic values for energy efficiency should increase the number of measures that are found to be cost effective from a societal perspective. It may not change the amount the utility will pay for measures. That may need to be based on the utility system value, not the societal value. But at least customers will have the opportunity to have some utility support for additional measures. I'll talk in a few minutes about how states may improve the financial attractiveness of these measures in other ways. The EPA report places a different value, slightly different, on peak-oriented energy efficiency than on baseload efficiency. We can see the difference in these from breakfast table. Kitchen lighting measures, which are lighting is used primarily in the morning and, and early evening, are very peak-oriented loads. Conversely, the savings from more efficient refrigerators, while significant, are spread through all 24 hours of the day. When utilities procure new resources, they often look at what we call avoided cost to measure the savings they will achieve in capital and other operating costs. It might typically look something like this. With quantification of health benefits now available, it's important to recognize that these health benefits will be achieved if renewable resources or efficiency displace fossil fuels. These higher avoided costs are shown on the right. The additional value would only be available to non-emitting resources. The same needs to be considered when utilities dispatch existing power plants. If they dispatch a fossil resource, they typically consider only the fuel and O&M costs and the decision of what resource to dispatch, shown here on the left. The EPA report is presented as health benefits of energy efficiency and renewable resources, but it could just as easily have been titled health costs of operating fossil fuel resources. Considering these health effects in the utility dispatch process may result in some cleaner resources, such as renewables coupled with energy storage, becoming the resources of choice in the utility dispatch order. Here on slide uh, 32, uh, 31, we see the range from low to high of uh, the health benefits of energy efficiency and renewables for several regions taken from the data in the EPA report. In these regions, and this is not the whole country, they range from a low of about a penny at the low end in Texas to a high of over eight cents in the mid-Atlantic region. In the last year, utilities have acquired wind energy for under two cents a kilowatt hour and solar for under three cents, shown here in the red circle for XL Colorado and NV Energy in Nevada. This is at the low end of the range of health benefits for most of the country. In addition, of course, the new wind and solar will displace operating costs of existing power plants or avoid capital costs for new power plants. And that those avoided cost savings may also be higher than the total cost of new renewable energy resources. Yes, I mean, in parts of the country, New wind and solar may be worth twice as much as they cost. First, to displace more expensive generating resources, and then also to reduce health care costs for asthma and other preventable health impacts. And that's even before considering carbon dioxide benefits, which are not included in the EPA tool. I'll now turn to how we can better reflect health impacts in retail electricity rates. A typical residential rate includes a customer charge and a flat energy charge. If our current rate is $10 a month plus 12 cents a kilowatt hour, we can change this to put more emphasis on the per kilowatt hour charge in order to reflect the health impacts of marginal generation. In this example, I've reduced the monthly fixed charge and added uh, a penny a kilowatt hour into the energy charge. Raising the energy charge more accurately reflects those health impact costs of marginal generation. 
in this example, I've, I've reduced the uh, customer charge. Uh, we would not expect uh, a difference in, in in number of customers, but we would expect a difference in the number of kilowatt hours people consume. A second option would be to separate the rates uh, for clean and emitting resources. Many utilities have a limited amount of wind, solar, hydro, or nuclear energy in their system. It doesn't have uh, the criteria pollutant. Puget Sound Energy, which is the utility that serves my home, has a two block inclining block rate. Since this was created 40 years ago, the first block has been intended to reflect mostly hydro resources. The upper block reflects newer resources, which for PSE have been mostly coal and natural gas. Any utility could implement a rate like this with a lower rate for a limited amount of non emitting energy. That could include wind, solar, hydro, or nuclear. A higher rate would apply for power from emitting resources. For PSA, because the hydro is low cost, this inclining block rate is a cost-based rate. For other utilities, it might reflect a surcharge on emitting resources offset by a rebate on the initial block of power from non-emitting resources in order to reflect the health benefits of those non-emitting resources. I'll now turn briefly to large commercial customers, big box stores, office buildings, customers that have demand charges in the rates. Uh, this may be a little esoteric for those of you from the health profession on the call, uh, but the utility folks will I think understand it. Here's a pretty a simple, but pretty typical uh, rate design for this type of customer with a demand charge. I've ignored the customer charges, uh, it's cost of Billing and collection are a pretty minimal part of the electric bill for large commercial customers. So $10 a kilowatt based on non-coincident demand plus 10 cents a kilowatt hour is a starting point. Commercial rates can change to reflect the health benefits of, uh, of clean resources or the health costs of, of emitting resources. One option is to limit the demand charges to key hours when the generation, transmission, or distribution system is experiencing stress. A number of studies have showed that if you can confine the on-peak period to no more than three hours, that customers can, will, and do respond. For example, on a solar-rich utility, that might be 5 to 8 p.m. This change means a bit less in demand charge revenue because many commercial customers have their individual non-coincident peak demand between nine in the morning and five in the afternoon during the business day. We need to make that up somewhere to keep the utility recovering its allowed revenue requirement. This example recovers that revenue requirement through a higher energy charge in the five to 8 p.m. period. This rate is unlikely to lead to increased usage during the non-peak period because the rate is unchanged to 10 cents. But the 30% increase in the on-peak rate should read, lead to about a 9% decrease in the on-peak energy use. So that reduces costs, system peak, the need for ramping resources, and also emissions. Of course, utility pricing and procurement are not the only ways that states can reflect the health benefits of efficiency and renewables. There are some legislative options, not in the realm of the utility or air regulator. I'll start with energy efficiency. This can include a sales tax exemption, as Missouri does with an efficient appliance sales tax holiday. A state, state tax credit for energy efficiency investments, as Kentucky does. Direct purchase incentives from state funds, as Alaska does with its home energy rebate program. Or direct install programs for low-income customers, as Illinois does with its efficient living energy grant program. Turning to renewables, these health benefits can also be recognized through legislated tax incentives. A state income tax credit like that in Hawaii, a property tax exemption such as that in New Jersey, or a sales tax exemption like that in Connecticut. The bottom line is that our layer cake 
uh, with the benefit of the EPA report, now has uh, a little better definition as to one of these layers of benefits. Let's call it a little more, more frosting on the cake, something that even a four-year-old can tell you is really important. Thank you, and I'm going to hand it back to Megan to take your questions. Well, thank you, Jim, and also to Emma and Nancy for some great presentations. So as Jim noted, we're going to turn now to a question and answer session. And we've already gotten a lot of good questions. Um, so I'm going to start with some of those. But please uh, continue to put your questions into the question pane and the GoToWebinar so that we can um, follow up on more questions as well. So um, starting off with the first question, um, uh, and this is really for you, Emma, probably, is, is does EPA plan to produce similar health values for emissions from thermal consumption or heating and cooling, industrial processes, that sort of thing? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, right now, we have developed the set of values um, for the technologies that we looked at based on the modeling capabilities that we have in our avert, avoided emissions and generation tool. We are currently exploring um, where there is demand for additional and similar types of resources and whether or not our tools um, have the ability to model those. So if folks have specific um, analyses that they are thinking about and, and values that would be of help to them, uh, you're welcome to follow up with me after this, and we can have more detailed discussion about that. Thank you very much. Um, the next one that we've gotten a couple questions on, so I want to make sure to ask all of you, is um, how is the disparity in ge geography included in these analysis? We, you noted the differences in, in regions, um, so maybe just getting in a little bit more to uh, some of how the regional differences are accounted for. Um, in the study and then how that plays out and how we use these. So maybe first to you, Emma, and then to Jim and Nancy for how that then is useful for decision makers. Sure. So the 10 re regions that we developed values for are based on the regions that the AVERT model uses to, uh, to break down the grid and how the U.S. electricity grid operates. It is an approximation and sort of a simplification, but it allows us to look at regional sort of behavior in different regions given the important factors of the different fuel mix um, within each of those regions. Um, those tools, both AVERT and COBRA, do have the capability of producing results down to the county level um, for the purposes of providing sort of a national set of values, uh, we determined that it made the most sense to take, um, to use those 10 overt regions and look at the, look at scenarios based um, on each of those regions. And then for the health impacts, um, when we model the health impacts um, resulting from changes in a particular region, those changes um, actually have health benefits broader than just in the region of analysis. So if you look at the technical report, you'll see what we did was we took sort of the national change in health benefits and then divided it by the regional change in generation for each of the 10 regions. If there are specific questions about how um, sort of the distribution of benefits at a resolution lower than the regional level, we can certainly go back and look at um, use COBRA to provide that information at a finer grained resolution and that is something that we can do in a custom analysis if there are particular um, individuals who are interested in doing that. If, um, thank you Emma, that, this is Nancy, that was a, a great explanation. I'm, I'm wondering um, if we can go to the, the slide that I didn't use some on the, with the renewables with the three different um, avert regions. Great, thank you. Um, just to give people a sense of how these numbers can vary across regions, um, I have the example of 100 megawatts, and this shows you for three of the 10 um, avert regions um, that Emma mentioned, sort of the variation um, and how the numbers roll out, using at least the, the solar and wind values, um, uh, not the efficiency values. Uh, but we, I'm happy to walk through, you, how we did the calculations in more detail at, at another time or with anyone who'd like that, that information. That sounds good. And there were some follow-up questions. Um, so maybe on those more specific follow-up questions about using the tool in different regions, we can have folks follow up with you all um, since they're pretty technical. Um, so the next question I wanted to uh, throw 
to you again, Emma, is um, there were some questions about the discount rate in this context and one note that it seemed low. So can you explain how EPA uh, came to that and, and how you, um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so of course, this is this is just an analytical choice. Um, EPA, as standard practice, uses both a 3% and a 7% discount rate for all of our economic analyses. So what I showed you today was just one set of values based on that 3% discount rate. Um, the, this is standard practice for all of our regulatory impact analyses where we do economic analysis, so we do have both sets. So in the end, there are values, there are like 16 values per region because you have the four technology types, the two discount rates, and the two levels of sensitivity. So that provides a range. So for analysts who are looking at, you know, at a particular policy or program, you know, highly suggest take take the value that you think is most appropriate for your use, but also consider looking at the range of values and providing a range of potential benefits um, in, your, in your analysis using the lower end and the higher end. It's, it really just comes down to what is appropriate for the, for the analysis that's being conducted. And um, there is more information in some of the, the technical report and as to like sort of the background and history of why EPA uses these values, but that they're standard. Yeah, in the utility industry, we 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 use discount rates in integrated resource planning and and other resource evaluation modeling. Uh, and the, the normal discount rate to use is what we call the net of tax cost of capital for the utility uh, for investor-owned utilities, uh, which is their allowed rate of return minus the uh, uh, tax benefits of the interest on on their debt. And that happens to come in around seven percent. For public power utilities, we typically use their cost of capital, which in today's capital market happens to come in around 3%. So the, the values that EPA is using are also very consistent with the range of values that we typically use in utility resource planning. For the next question, I'm going to combine a, a couple here. There was one that was asking about um, whether a gradually increasing price on greenhouse gas emissions would be a more simple way to account for health benefits of non emitting options. And then there have been a couple questions along those. Um, well, I'll let you answer that one because maybe that one's a little more specific. So who, well, I'll like answer that? that one very simply. We're not talking about greenhouse gas emissions. These are our criteria pollutants. And so a a tax on greenhouse gas emissions would uh, would, would not be taxing the correct pollutant uh, to address the the health benefits. Uh, it there there is a correlation uh, that is the same plants that emit greenhouse gases uh, also emit uh, criteria pollutants, but the relationship is is not uh, is, is not actually all that good. Thank you, Jim. Um, and there were a couple of questions about as the grid is becoming cleaner every year, um, how does that play into this analysis? And specifically, how should the benefits per kilowatt values be applied to a multi-year cost-benefit analysis? Sure, this is Emma. I, I'll take that question. Um, so we suggest that the, the health benefits per kilowatt hours are good for a fairly near term analysis for about about five years. And the current set of values was developed based on 2017 data. Um, just took us a little while to get them to get them published and we will be updating them in the future. Um, we suggest sort of a limitation to near-term analysis based on the models that were used to develop them. In particular, the AVERT model, um, it models the grid based on data that EPA receives on emissions from fossil-fired power plants. So it's near-term data. So the current model is operating off of 2018 data. And given that we know that the grid is going to be changing over over time and may change quite rapidly, we suggest that that you know that model is really good for about a five five year analysis. And so, at this point in time, I would recommend using these values for a relatively near term analysis. We know that as the grid um, does get cleaner, the cents per kilowatt hour values should decrease over time. And one of the things that EPA is looking at right now is how we might create a sort of more into the future set of values. 
patients. And so that is something that we have certainly um, seen a need for and uh, folks have expressed to us that being able to do longer term projections would be very valuable. And so we are, we are looking into how we might produce that. It just requires us to go back to the original models and, and you know, create different baseline years and things like that. So uh, we hope to be able to provide that in the future. Thanks, Mom. Um, another one is, if a region imports its electricity, are health impacts due to energy efficiency or renewable energy, um, do those accrue locally or in the geography where the electricity is generated? Is that addressed in any way? The, the, um, the, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that the avert model doesn't really look at transmission across the defined regions. So the way that we have modeled these values, we're looking at we're looking at um, sort of the impact to generation within the region. Um, but again, as I said, the the health related benefits those are national because we our model for our Cobra model looks at the air quality impacts on an sort of nationwide. Um, but right now, the way that the avert model is designed, it looks at changes in generation within the defined region. I hope that answers the question. Did you want to add to that, Jim? Or? Well, the, the one thing I'd add to it is that the health impacts uh, of, of combustion byproducts often happen, you know, wherever downwind is, which may be in a different region. Uh, from where the electricity is generated, wh whether that electricity is transmitted to another place or not. Uh, and I guess my question for Emma is, are the downwind impacts in other regions included in, in, in the quantification? Uh, that is, if, if the combustion occurs in Texas, are you measuring uh, and the, the generation happens in Texas and the consumption of the electricity happens in Texas, but the wind blows the emissions, uh, you know, towards Missouri or Kentucky or, or Georgia. Is are, you, is are you picking up those health impacts in those downwind affected regions in these calculations? Yes, the uh, the easy answer is yes. Um, so what we've done, and, and the technical report gets into discussion about this if folks are interested, but essentially to create the values, we took the nationwide impacts, health benefits, and divided that by the regional change in generation in order to account for the fact that a lot of the health benefits from changes in um, energy use in one region would happen outside that region. So yes, it's, it's, it's meant to capture the, the full extent of the health benefits for that change within that region. And Emma, this is Nancy, but I, I believe the AVERT model, if folks can want to use the BPK values in conjunction with AVERT, AVERT allows you to see which plants have reduced emissions based on the assumptions you put in there. Is that, yes. I remember correctly? Yes. Yeah, if folks wanted to get into doing a more custom level analysis and going back to the avert model, you can you can look down to the changes at the specific plant level. Yes, but the model itself doesn't really do, you know, energy use across regions. It's one of the limitations right. of the model. It's it's focused on the specific regions, and um, there's a whole host of reasons for that in the very deep technical manual for the model, um, which we don't need to get into here, but. But yes, folks can go and, and, and do a lot of different things with AVERT and get much more detailed if they're interested. And um, we are at EPA are always happy to help folks do that if there's a specific analytical need. And I think it, it, it uh, this is Nancy again, it merits mentioning that these are should be considered first order estimates for folks to give you sort of the, the direction that you might wanna be heading in an order of magnitude in terms of the benefits that you might achieve. Um, it's not intended to replace sort of specific state analyses or other more detailed modeling that might be needed for attainment planning or, or things like that. It's designed to give you a sense of, of the, t the range of benefits that you see if you use energy efficiency and renewable energy. Exactly. 
Great, thank you. And I'm going to give you all a short moment of pause to say that we've had a lot of questions asking for um, links to uh, the report and the slides. And so we will have links to both um, the slides that we've gone through today, as well as the EPA report um, in the presentation that we'll send out, or the, the link to the slides that we'll send out, as well as on our website. So you'll be able to get those for sure. So we appreciate everyone's interest. Um, so turning back to the questions, this might be one for you, Nancy. Um, how might the defined BPK reductions in societal health impacts and costs be used by public health commissions and healthcare sector planning? And there was an add-on, especially since airshed improvements can't be readily tracked to specific populations or locales. So I guess um, so my message to public health uh, advocates and to and to other health organizations on the line might be that similar similar to what the message to air quality regulators here here's an opportunity to show the benefits of efficiency and renewables in your area um, and an opportunity for you to talk to your colleagues about what kinds of measures and energy planning is going on that might lead to increased uh, deployment of efficiency resources and or an increase in your energy standard um, by showing by helping them demonstrate the health benefits from doing those types of things um, and the benefits that it would accrue with with less fossil generation um, I think I'm. I think I'm getting. I've got, the, um, yeah, I've, the, I'm getting at the question. I hope that's that. Too. Yeah, I've got yes. part of a response to this question also. Uh, there, there's you know there's a provision in Medicare reimbursement that if if uh, uh, if hospitals have excessive recidivism for preventable illnesses, that they their compensation is is docked and one hospital network in Missouri uh, was having recidivism from respiratory ailments and uh, they tracked it down to uh, uh, air quality in this case it was indoor air quality and uh, began co-funding uh, with the low-income weatherization program and the utility uh, energy efficiency improvements uh, in in customers homes to address their indoor air quality issues the same concept could apply for a hospital district or a, or, or a uh, uh, health network uh, to if, if it is experiencing high costs from from health impacts uh, to uh, look at uh, getting involved in the utility regulatory process to promote uh, cleaning up the, uh, the the power supply through efficiency and deployment of renewables or through other technical means. Uh, and that's a, just another place that uh, that the health community can become involved is become more aware of what uh, utility regulation can do to address health impacts. Thanks to both of you. Um, the next one was about whether or not EPA is planning to or has looked at this um, tool in relation to solar plus storage or uh, efficiency um, combined or solar and other renewables combined with storage. Um, can you speak to that, Emma? Yeah, we, we've actually been getting a lot of questions lately about how these values could be used to assess the impacts of storage. And so there are some important considerations, I think, to keep in mind, of course, you know, to for the batteries to be just charged, they have to be charged. And so the question is, you know, depending on the scenario that you're modeling, whether that's from a renewable source like solar or if that's coming from other fossil generation, because you would need to account for any emissions and impacts associated with charging from fossil. But if you are um, charging from a non-emitting source, the um, discharge of the battery is essentially similar to can be modeled just like we would model energy efficiency because we're reducing um, kilowatt hours. And so as we've presented the values right now, we didn't design them for that analysis, uh, with that analysis in mind. Um, so what we have is we have efficiency values for peak hours, um, and then which we've defined as 12 to 6 p.m. on weekdays, and then we have efficiency for sort of uniform measures that we that we're we're saying you know if you 
um, efficiency that would have the same impact and reduction for all hours of the day and um, and year. And so if you have storage that's charged on renewables and you're looking at what the impacts of, say, discharging during peak hours, you could use the peak EE, um, peak EE values that we have developed. The uniform EE is not really an accurate equivalent to off-peak, so we are actually looking at right now whether or not it makes sense for us to be developing off-peak EE values so that there could be comparisons made, you know, if, if folks who are looking at storage want to look at the impacts of discharging during different times of the day. Thank you. All right. Um, one, thing, one thing that needs to be considered in the storage question is the round-trip losses from charging and discharging storage. For the newest lithium-ion batteries, that's maybe as little as 10%, which is ter terrific. Uh, for pump storage, it's going to be 18 to 22%, and for compressed air energy storage, as much as 35%. You don't get out as much as you put in. Uh, it's 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 uh, and so if you charge the storage with uh, with a natural gas resource and then use it to displace generation. Uh, that might have come from uh, from a, a less efficient gas plant. Uh, you, uh, you you have to factor that that loss uh, in to determining uh, the the net emissions impact. Yes, and that's a good point. I, I should mention that you know the avert model that we've used as part of this analysis. Um, we are building capacity in that model right now to look at questions related to to batteries, and it will account for things like that. So that is something that is in development um, that um, hopefully will be available in the near future for folks who are looking at questions related to storage. Thank you. Um, Another one was talking about that using the cost per kilowatt hour is one way to look at this, but have you included the cost benefits of avoiding new capacity or demand side management as another approach, or was that not considered in your analysis? It's kind of Sorry, just to make sure I understand the question. Oh. So the question is about avoiding need for increased capacity so yeah, avoiding... I think actually Emma I, I I think I understand this question better the all that we've talked about is the health benefits that is the reduced premature fatalities non-fatal heart attacks respiratory ailments caused by reducing the emissions from power plants this this analysis today hasn't talked at all about the uh, uh, impact on the utility avoiding either generation fuel and operating costs or generation capacity costs. I talked about that for uh, for for a moment uh, back in my my slide. I think it's 31. Donna, if you can back up to that one. Uh, when uh, it's not 31, it's uh, 32, maybe. No, it's my, my avoided cost slide. Uh, so it's two. There we go. Uh, and, nope. There we go. The the blue section at the bottom here was the avoided capital cost uh, that utilities consider when they look at uh, uh, procurement uh for long-term resources over, over in an integrated resource plan they're going to avoid some capital costs i think that's what the question is getting at this entire discussion today has only been about the green box on the right the health benefits uh of uh reducing of, of replacing uh fossil generation with energy efficiency or renewable so it hasn't addressed uh that part of the equation and the point that i made at the end of my presentation that some of these uh, efficiency and renewable measures may be worth twice as much as they cost because they both avoid utility capital and operating costs, but they also avoid health impact costs uh, is important. But we did not talk about the blue, red, or black parts of this today, only about the green part. 
Well, thank you. And we're at the top of the hour. So I'm going to, as I noted um, previously, we're going to wrap up the sort of formal hour long webinar here, but then we will stay on for another half an hour for the additional questions that we do have and um, any others that folks want to ask. So I want to thank um, all of our presenters today for a great discussion. And just to summarize a little bit, we can really see from EPA's report and the discussion here today that the health benefits of efficiency and renewables are significant. And these benefits are really too big to ignore. And EPA's tool finally gives us a way to quantify those benefits and use them in decision-making processes. Regulators and policymakers can incorporate this data into planning, rate design, and more. And this will be even more effective if energy and air quality officials work together, as we can see from some of these questions. So um, the EPA is interested in how this work is being used and welcomes questions about it. And as noted, we'll have links to those reports um, and we'll be sending around a recording and the slides from this webinar. webinar. So. Um, with that, uh, that concludes our first formal hour of the webinar, and we'll continue with some questions, um, uh, the additional questions we have now. So, uh, Megan, it's Nancy. Could I go back actually to the last question for a second? Oh, Maybe please to, do. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I was just in my mind. I, I, I certainly agree with Jim about how we've stacked up and looking at the costs, but. In my mind, if states are facing sort of decisions about whether to ramp up existing resources or look at um, new resources, at least the, 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 the benefit per kilowatt hour tool can be used to give you a sense of, of the health portion of that. As Jim said, the green box that could be that you can get if you don't go with a fossil fuel resource. And also, as, as some of our examples have shown, that can offset, in some cases, the entire cost of doing efficiency or a new renewable resource, which I hope would steer people more towards those resources as, as opposed to uh, looking at additional fossil resources. Uh, Jim, is that uh, anything to add to that? Or is that, I just wanted to put a nope. fine point on how you were no, you, you talking got it. about it. Thanks for that. All right. Well, um, maybe following up on that a little bit, there was some uh, there were some questions about looking at renewable energy and the health impacts or health benefits versus energy efficiency. So whether or not there's differences in the analysis for those two things, can you talk about that a little bit more? How that was analyzed. So the difference in how we assessed health impacts related to efficiency versus renewables. Yes, efficient. and the question was um, to, to add a little more on what they said. They were saying they would think that not using any energy creates less pollution than using energy of some kind. So how early in the life cycle, life cycle does the EPA tool begin its calculation? So if it's going Great. back and so, forth. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is maybe a more detailed question about the um, avert model itself that we used. And so um, what, I, what I would recommend is um, actually uh, looking at the, um, the, the manual for the avert model itself, if there are specific questions about how the details of how particular technologies are are assessed um, because we have details for the different types of scenarios that we run in there, um, both efficiency and renewables, um, rather than maybe get into that right now. And I can provide a direct link to the, to the detailed information and in, in manuals for both of the models um, that you can distribute with the slides later today. Okay, that's great. And there was a related question about whether or not there's some sort of simple tool um, that you could plug in, um, let's say a utility could easily plug in their estimated energy savings from a new program and pick their relevant location um, to get the estimated health benefits. And the questioner noted that it might be overdoing it in terms of user friendliness, but figured it couldn't hurt to ask. So I'll ask as well <laughs> um, if that's something that, that, that would be more in, along the lines of what you said of getting into the details of that model, or if there's a simpler way to get some uh, big picture answers. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, it sounds like the interest is really in understanding at a finer resolution where the health impacts are um, accruing um, and the health benefits are accruing. And so essentially the the simplified tool or 
those are the models that we used to to design these values. So if there is a specific, and there is a function that enables the user to easily export the outputs from the avert model into the COBRA model so that you can go from putting in a specific scenario um, to getting the health um, the health uh, impacts and the, the associated dollar values. So really, if you want to get into the finer resolution, the distribution of the benefits, that would be the primary way to do so. We created these values as a even more simplified first step because we were hearing from a range of stakeholders that being able to have something sort of akin to like an emissions factor in terms of sort of the simplicity was a really great first step to getting to getting uh, health benefits acknowledged and even thought about in some of these decision making processes but of course there is um, need and value for looking at more detailed results and more customized results but I think the existing tools we have could certainly can certainly do what the questioner is asking and um, we offer training on those tools and our and our always happy to help out with with specific analyses. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, a more specific question about the impact of particulate matter on um, premature fatalities. So this questioner was noting that recent studies show particulate matter causing 200,000 premature fatalities in the U.S., but the slides mention 100,000 premature fatalities per year. Um, do you know about the data used for those or whether there's any fluctuation in that with this being studied more recently? Sure. So um, the data that I have on my slides comes from the State of Global Air Report, the 2019 profile for U.S., which I believe is based on 2017 um, data that they used for, for that study. So I think it's just a question of the source, and I would need to know more about the source source that the questioner is referring to. Okay, they have a link here, so maybe we can, that can be one that can be a follow-up um, question for later. So um, we'll make sure to get that to you, Emma. Let's see. Um, and the next question was, how should health benefits be taken into account for states that have multiple electric utilities? So should customer health benefits for a utility project be considered in the evaluation of a new plant or energy efficiency project which gets recovered in base rates or rate design? This might be one for you, Jim, or you, Nancy. Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's a tough question. Uh, you know, I mean, I live in a state where uh, many of our utilities are virtually 100% renewable today uh, because of the, the legacy hydro that we have in, in the Pacific Northwest, whereas three of our utilities have very significant thermal production. Uh, but pragmatically, uh, energy efficiency on any of these utilities is ultimately manifest in reduced dispatch of fossil generation. Uh, and because the hydro is going to produce everything it can, it will be sold into the wholesale market and displace fossil generation uh, if it's uh, not needed by the utilities that have the ownership or contract rights that hydro. Uh, so the, the health effects are, you know, not, first of all, they're not just in the service territory. They're not just in the state, as we talked earlier. They include downwind health effects. Uh, and that can be quite awkward for regulators. Should Washington state electric consumers uh, pay more for electricity so that people in downwind states will have fewer health costs? that get paid by either them or their state or their insurers or the federal government. Uh, and there's not an easy answer to that, uh, but the correct answer is clearly not zero, that we certainly shouldn't be ignoring those impacts in making decisions. They're real costs uh, that we impose when we consume power in this region uh, or someone else causes when they consume power in a different region. Uh, and we certainly need to quantify them and figure out uh, at the air regulator, health agency, and utility regulator how to not ignore them. Zero is the wrong number. Following up on that, um, for you, Jim, the North, this person noted that the Northwest Power Council decided not to use the results based in part on the short term or short time applicability restrictions. Can you speak to? That yeah, I'm, I'm actually a member of the Northwest Power and Conservation Council's uh, Conservation Resources Advisory Committee, 
and the EPA report recommended not using this data for more than five years because resource mixes are changing. Uh, and in fact, in this region, by five in, in, in by 2025, nearly all of the coal resources that we use uh, will no longer be providing service to the region. Uh, and uh, the power plan that they are developing is not going to affect anything prior to 2022. And they said, if we can't use this data for more than five years, uh, and we're not going to start using this plan until 2022, maybe we can't use this data at all. And I was frustrated by that, and I think I'm going to hand it off to Emma, because the EPA is, as I understand it, working on getting more years into this uh, so that it is uh, more applicable for long-term resource planning. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah, one of the things that we are going to be looking at um, in in the near term is how we can provide values and resource, resources that are going to be helpful for more longer term projection. You know, as I mentioned, I think one of the one of the limitations we have right now is the simplified type of model that that avert the modeling that avert is doing, looking at the grid. So it's looking at you know the Basically, it is a historical generation model. So it takes the data from the most current data set and runs some statistics to look at, you know, the probability of any particular plant being running at, for a given load and what the probability is of a particular, you know, emissions output. And so that's very much based on the behavior and dynamics of the grid as it exists today. It's not a more sophisticated sort of economic dispatch model. Um, so one of the things that we have to think about is is, you know, the tools that we have were designed for in, to, to meet specific analytical needs where we where we had, um, you know, before we had built Avert, there was a lot of interest in being able to look at the emissions impact of efficiency and renewables in a more cost effective and, and simplified way um, for analysts as a starting point, um, you know, in, in their work. And so I think that um, the question for us it really is, is how would EPA construct values for longer term analysis? And that is something that we are just beginning to explore. So we hope to be able to, to meet that need. We know that a lot of different types of end users are, are thinking about strategies with longer term objectives in mind, thinking about questions of, you know, sort of mid-century decarbonization and other things and want to, want to know how these strategies can contribute to that. Um, so we are, um, we will be continuing to explore and you know, welcome input and insights from experts. Thank you both. Um, and along those lines for you, Emma, this has sort of been touched on in previous questions, but more specifically, are there plans to expand this tool to other pollutants? And this person mentions criteria pollutants and or HAPs, but I think, that, so maybe just uh, clarifying a little bit what's covered and what might be covered in the future. Sure. So the reason why this analysis focuses specifically on fine particulate model is because uh, fine particulate matter PM 2.5 is because that's what Cobra at the Cobra model assesses. We have, um, you know, to to look at say the impacts of something like ozone. It's a different kind of modeling that um, that is involved. There's it's quite complex, you know, photochemical interactions that are occurring in the formation of ozone with lots of different environmental um, factors that contribute uh, to that formation. Um, for fine particulate matter, we were able to develop a reduced form model from existing more sophisticated models. The methodology for doing that for something like ozone is something that we're going to actually be looking into. Um, I'm not sure if it actually exists yet. So we are exploring that. We know that in particular we've had a, we've received a lot of requests for ozone. Um, our models right now look um, our you know our model right now is specifically looking only at outdoor air quality. Um, HAPs can sort of mean different things in different contexts. It can mean hazardous air pollutants or it can mean household air pollution. Um, so <laughs> depending on what the questioner has in mind, um, right now we don't include either in terms of how you define it. Um, but we are aware that, you know, there's also a lot of interest in thinking about indoor environmental quality and how can strategies like efficiency um, contribute to that and how do we document those results. And there's a whole 
I think field of practice and, and contingency of experts and organizations looking at that too. Um, but for now, we have focused on PM 2.5 because we had a ready-to-go model that was looking at that. The near-term thing we'll be looking at is, is how might we address ozone. Uh, it's been a particular request. Well, I think um, it, it might merit mention, um, Emma, though, that uh, EPA consistently, when you look at the where the most immediate and very high levels of impact on mortality, asthma, CO, COPD issues comes from particulate matter. And so it, if, if you had to pick something to start with, this was an excellent one um, to start with because a lot of the impacts of air pollution on people's health comes from particulate matter. Um, yeah, and if you look at the slide with the bar chart that I had on it, you can see that, you know, the PM 2.5 is, is, is a huge chunk of, of the bar when it comes to, uh, to air quality, and that is um, much earlier in the presentation. Um, and, and what that is, uh, the slide on PM 2.5, there you go, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so the red portion is the ambient PM 2.5, and I think according to sort of uh, other EPA sources, we said that like something like 85% of the impact of outdoor air pollution is really coming from the PM. So yes, it's a great place to start. It's why COBRA specifically focuses on that. And um, and we know that there's a lot of interest in, in other pollutants as well. And we're going to see what we can, um, what it would take to be able to put um, other pollutants, like particularly ozone, into our model, while keeping in mind that the tool that we have is really designed to be a more simplified resource. EPA does have other tools um, that could be used for more sophisticated air quality analysis and for a broader range of pollutants. Yeah, let me, let's hold on this slide for, for just a second, uh, please. Um, we've been talking about the, the societal air quality impacts uh, of efficiency. That is the downwind air impacts from changes in power plant emissions. But I, I do want to draw attention to the participant benefits uh, that are also very important. Uh, in New Zealand, during the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, they made a decision to weatherize all low-income housing in the country over four years. It was a stimulus program for uh, the building trades more than anything else to put those folks back to work. Uh, and the evaluation, the first evaluation work came out, you know, 2009 was the first program year and 2010 was the first data collection year and 2011, the first uh, evaluation reports came out and they found that indeed the energy efficiency improvements were cost effective, uh, but because they had improved air control, reduced mold uh, in houses, they also found a 43% reduction in hospitalizations due to respiratory ailments among the, the residents of the homes, uh, a 37% reduction in days lost at work, and a 23% reduction in days lost at school. Uh, and when I saw the work loss days here at the bottom, those are, for, for the purpose of today's discussion, those are downwind. For energy efficiency uh, in particular, there may be participant health benefits that are entirely separate from and additional to uh, the uh, downwind societal uh, health benefits. Uh, and it's important uh, for uh, utilities and health professionals to be aware of, of, of that potential, particularly in, in climates where mold is an issue. Thank you all, that's great. And actually heads off some questions about um, sort of the indoor, indoor air quality piece, which was, um, was asked by a few folks. So um, I'll go to the next one, which is fairly specific about Hawaii, where energy costs are about 30 cents um, per kilowatt hour. And so this questioner was just wondering how the analysis would be for Hawaii if they include health issues. And, and Jim, maybe I'll kick this one to you because I know you've done a lot of work there um, and looking at rate design issues. And, and Emma can correct me if I'm wrong. First of all, the EPA report doesn't include Alaska and Hawaii's regions, correct, Emma? That's correct. The avert model currently yeah. is only for the continental U.S. Uh, uh, the second thing is that in uh, Hawaii, 
uh, with one exception, uh, doesn't generally have much in the way of air quality issues because it, they're islands and in the middle of a big ocean. Um, and the pollution tends to blow away. The obvious exception is the, the VOG, the volcanic fog from uh, 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 the Kilauea volcano, uh, which has blanketed the islands in, at, from time to time in, in quite unhealthy air. Uh, but the power plants have been located in places where the, uh, uh, the, the prevailing winds take the uh, pollution offshore and the, there's very little in the way of local health impact from, from power generation. Uh, so I suspect if the EPA did include it, it would be lower than California simply because of the rather rapid dispersal of a relatively small amount of, of pollution uh, into a very large airshed. Thank you. Good clarification. Um, the next question was whether there's a way to extrapolate to the health effects of reducing gas consumption in heat, hot water, or similar gas consumption. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense particularly. I mean, first of all, you know, roughly half of American homes have natural gas, space, and water heat. And there's two parts to that. Uh, you know, there's the uh, e emissions out the stack, uh, but at least in the case of gas cooking, the emissions occur inside the conditioned space and have a very different health impact than than stuff that goes up up the stack. Uh, but the the other part of the issue for for uh, gas, space, and water heat is there's a fairly active effort at electrification of many of those loads in, in several states and communities. Uh, and that would shift the pollution impact from distributed natural gas appliances to uh, the electric grid, which could be either centralized or distributed and could be uh, clean or not so clean. Uh, and you know what you replace gas distributed use of gas with is probably extremely important in determining uh, that package. I, I, I'll leave it to Nancy and Emma to talk about what the uh, localized health impacts are of, of gas appliances versus electric appliances. Well, I, I think in terms of using um, the EPA uh, BPK values, um, you could look, for example, at an efficiency program in your state that would seek to aggregate the changeover of a number of gas appliances to uh, electric and what the impact of that electricity would be given the mix of grids, the mix of resources on your grid now and what you anticipate in the future. Um, my, my understanding, and Emma can correct me if I'm wrong, is this is the tool is not designed to be used at an individual household level. You want to look at it aggregated at, say, a, a statewide program level. Um, but um, as Jim was saying, as we move towards electrification of resources, I, I think it's a, it's a, would be a good uh, thing to look at in terms of if you've got a lot of gas uh, homes fired, uh, heated by gas, sorry, excuse me, and you want to convert them to electricity and you know what the grid mix is now and what it's likely to be in the future, you could show the health benefits of doing that kind of conversion or detriments, depending on the kind of grid you have now, um, in terms of doing that um, conversion, but at a larger scale, not just an, an individual homeowner's scale. Yeah, yeah I mean, obviously, yeah, I think the electrification correct. of wood-heated houses uh, with electricity that comes from a renewable resource is going to have a very different impact than electrification of natural gas heated houses and replacing it with uh, by re, you know keeping coal plants operating for longer periods. Yes, uh, absolutely. It, yeah, wood is a particularly difficult case, but does have a lot of impacts both in your house and outside your house, which would be a good one to maybe Emma. That's one we could talk about trying to figure out how to do. 
Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And and, and you're right. Yeah, the, the, the modeling that we've done is really for a bit more of an aggregate um, assessment. And, and that is, again, the derivative of sort of how the of our model does work. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly if there are, you know, we are we are very conscious of the fact that a lot there's a lot of discussion around um, beneficial electrification and thinking and we are thinking through just sort of in other parts of our program here um, you know how to how to assess the benefits and and, and, and analyze um, those kinds of programs as well um, so so we were following that discussion as well and you know looking at how um, Right now, we are looking at how different types of electrification like, have impacts on emissions. You know, thinking thinking through what Jim was saying about you know it's going to depend on where that new electric demand how that how that is being met. And I'll say on a slightly different topic, like with electric vehicles, this is coming up as well. And we are looking at with the avert model, like how to assess those kinds of impacts as well. Thanks. Well, Emma, you've kind of already headed off what I was going to ask next, which was basically just to give you an opportunity to talk about um, what EPA feels are next steps or um, any, any words you have for participants about um, resources available, et cetera. So you, you kind of just went over that, but if there's anything else you wanted to add, um, please do so. Sure. I, I think the most immediate thing that we are really interested in is, is helping folks um, understand how to use these values and and documenting um, where they are used. Um, because, you know, we, we had a sense going into this that this could be a very, very powerful resource and could be used in a wide variety of analyses. And so we are very eager to collect the and document those case studies and understand um, because through that process, we will learn a lot about how health benefits can be influential in, de in decision making and where there might be opportunities for us to either cover different types of measures with these values. And, you know, we've like we've already talked about, you know, there's there's questions around storage, there's questions around electrification, there's questions around doing longer term impact analyses. And these are all things that are very valuable for us to hear because our at the end of the day, our objective is to provide freely available, credible and easy to use resources to help more fully account for the value of efficiency and renewables so that when decisions are being made, things like the health benefits are being taken into consideration. And so we want to strive to continue to do that and to meet needs as they evolve and change and to track how these analytical tools can play an important role in decision making and policy. So we are open to feedback and we are open to requests for assistance and we are here and available um, if folks want to work with us. Thank you for that, Emma, and thank you to Nancy and Jim as well for a great discussion and presentations today. Um, I'm going to wind up the, the webinar now. We're almost at, um, at 1.30 my time, 3.30 Eastern, um, and just say that, you know, as Jim has noted a couple times, we've known for a long time that these benefits are there um, from these resource choices, and we've known that the value isn't zero, but EPA's uh, report and, and tool really gives us a way to actually monetize those benefits and to use them in decision-making processes. And so regulators and policymakers can now really incorporate this data into planning and to rate design um, into other decision making processes. And we see how this can really uh, join energy and air quality officials to be able to work together to discuss some of these benefits. Um, so with that, I want to thank our presenters and thank all of our participants as well for taking the time to join us today. And um, we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>